Now that we've worked out all the individual activities that we're going to complete inspections, testing and checks for, the next step is to write an inspection and test plan to document these checks. An inspection and test plan, or ITP for short, is a document that describes the plan for completing the quality control activities for a given work lot. It's basically a list of all the checks we'll do to make sure a given construction activity results in a product that complies with the design and technical specifications. ITPs are required for all significant construction activities resulting in a deliverable to the client. They're prepared prior to work's beginning by the project engineer looking after the works or may be prepared by subcontractors. Typically, although not always the case, the client or owner's engineer will then review the ITP and sign off on it. All this has to happen before works begin on site. We shouldn't be completing works on site without an approved ITP in place. The ITP for the activity is then completed as works are being performed on site. All tests and inspections documented should be performed to check and verify the works are being completed correctly. Once closed out, this is submitted to the client or owner's engineer for their review and sign-off. Any failures will result in a non-conformance report, but we'll cover those later on in the course. Our ITP should cover each construction activity identified in the quality lot map. This will depend on a range of factors, but as examples, on previous projects, we've completed one ITP per concrete foundation pile, one per section of conduit installation, or one per structural concrete pour. But what about activities like traffic management or service proving? Well, as these are activities that facilitate works but don't result in deliverables, there's no need to capture these in an ITP. Let's now look at how an ITP is structured. Attached to the course notes is an example inspection and test plan structure. As we work through this section, we'll populate this structure. The top section of an ITP is where you fill out all the background information, so basic things like the project name, relevant design package, the engineer or supervisor managing the works, date, subcontractor responsible, and so on. Under that is the basic structure of the ITP, where we'll write out the detailed activity steps and key points so we know exactly how to complete all the quality control checks necessary for the activity. Under the test activity section, we'll list out in detail all the steps to complete that activity. We'll cover what all these steps are in a second because it's more than just the basic construction activities. Under the governing specification section, we'll need to list what specification or standard we'll be referring to. This comes from the design, technical specifications or governing standard, like for example, AS3000, the Australian standard that governs electrical installations we'll use when completing electrical works. Then, under test method, we'll need to detail the test we are going to conduct to check that the activity has been completed correctly. In the timing and frequency column, we'll note down how often we have to do this test. Are we going to do it every day, every 20 metres of trenching, or for every pit we install? Next, we've got our acceptance criteria. This is where we nominate what type of records, documentation, or evidence we'll provide to verify that the activity passed the nominated test. This may be as simple as a tick of approval. We may require photos and so on. Finally, under the responsible section, we'll note down who is responsible for approving that activity and the evidence. In some instances, the project engineer reviewing the works can approve. In others, the client or owner's engineer may need to inspect them. I'll go through each of these headings in a little bit more detail now and how to work out how to fill out all the relevant information. Under the test activity section, we'll need to list out all the activities required to complete the task. This will be the basis of our ITP structure, listing out in detail every step required to complete the construction activity. This will be based on the construction methodology and should be comprehensive. We can't just list out the physical works taking place on site. We need to list out all the relevant steps, from site establishment to activity closeout. All construction activities have the same general sequence. Number one is issuing our design to the crew completing the works. This will be a check to ensure the correct revision of the drawings and specifications have been issued, including any relevant design changes. Number two is material supply. We'll need to ensure approved materials are being used. Factory testing is completed. Any relevant mock-ups or samples are okay, and they are stored correctly. Then, 
Number three is to the handover from previous trades and the subcontractor or work crew is ready to take possession of the site. This has commercial implications and an important step. Number four is to the survey set out and dimensional checks to ensure the work location is correct. Five is the actual construction activity itself, including any testing, inspection and hold points. Once the works are complete, number six is the survey pickup and as building, followed by seven, which is any testing on the completed works. Then eight will be the activity closeout and handover to the subsequent trades or commissioning. As you can see, there's a lot more to any single activity than just the physical construction works. Once we've listed out all the activities, against each activity, we'll need to know the governing specification or standard. This depends a lot on the works being undertaken. We want to identify the desired requirement we are trying to achieve and where this requirement comes from. If our activity is excavation and we're completing a compaction test, where does this requirement for a compaction test and what result does the compaction test have to achieve? We need to note that down. These requirements could come from the design, a technical specification or a governing standard. The test method defines what test we are undertaking. This test needs to prove compliance to the relevant standard or specification. The tests may be specific to the discipline or activity, like concrete testing for concrete works or compaction testing for excavation, or they could be generic tests like a visual inspection, photos or delivery dockets for materials. Under the timing and frequency section, we'll nominate how regularly we'll conduct any test. This is basically how often we're proposing to do it. This can either be time-based or activity-based. A time-based requirement would specify that we'll do the testing every week or month. Activity-based testing specifies that we'll do these tests at a given frequency of works, so for every lot or every 20 metres of trenching. The requirements for timing and frequency generally come from specifications or standards. For example, in the client's concrete work specifications, they may nominate that the owner's engineer must inspect the reinforcement before every concrete pour. Therefore, the frequency of this test would be per pour. Other times, we may determine how often we want to do these checks. If we're having a lot of errors, issues and defects, we may choose to complete tests more regularly. Our acceptance criteria is the required result from tests we've undertaken. So if we're doing compaction testing, what KPA does the ground have to meet? If we're doing concrete testing, what 28-day strength do we need to obtain? There are a couple of broad categories of acceptance requirements. There are test results, so for our concrete testing, we'd get a result saying we met the 28-day concrete strength nominated in the design and attach this to our ITP. This would need to be done by an approved laboratory or testing agency. Then, there are subjective verification requirements. These may be physical checks that we've done on site that we tick to say are complete. It could also be a client-specified hold point where the client signs something to say they approve works to proceed. And finally, we can also provide physical records, for example, photos or delivery dockets, to prove that step has been completed. When understanding what the acceptance criteria is, it's important to understand the design criteria and tolerances. These are usually specified tolerances in the design, like plus or minus 10 millimetres for precast concrete. If it's within tolerance, it's okay. If it's out of tolerance, well, we'll cover what to do there in our NCR section. The last section of ITP is the responsible section. That's where we nominate who is responsible for approving that section of works. We nominate the party that has to sign off and whether or not works can progress past that point without obtaining approval from the responsible party. The different parties nominated in this section could be the subcontractor, an engineer or supervisor, the client or owner's engineer, or an independent third party, for example, like an electrical inspector or geotechnical engineer. We'll also need to nominate whether works can or can't proceed prior to this approval. A hold point means work cannot proceed without the relevant approval. A witness point means the relevant party must be nominated but works can still proceed. And a review point means works can still proceed but the relevant person will review something after the fact. There are three steps to writing an inspection and test plan. First, we need to review and understand the key inputs. These will be the work breakdown structure, design drawings, technical specifications and the construction methodology. Then we'll list our methodology and populate all the other columns of our ITP against this. 
Finally, we'll submit this to the quality team for their review and approval. On some projects, the client and owner's engineer will need to sign off on this as well. We'll need to integrate and sign off on their comments. We'll now go through these steps in detail by drafting an example inspection and test plan. The example ITP we're going to create will be for the installation of underground electrical conduits. If you don't know what conduit is, it's basically buried pipe that electricians run cables through to reticulate power or feed assets like street lighting. I've attached a copy of the example ITP to the course notes so you can follow along. Our first step is to review and understand the key inputs. We need to review the design methodology and governing specifications. Our design shows a trench alignment, so where the conduit root goes, and a trench profile cross-section. The cross-section shows the trench profile, depth of cover, backfill material, and marker tape. Reviewing the project specifications and requirements, we need to be using quarry material from an approved quarry. We need a permit to excavate and compaction testing is required every 20 metres. Additionally, as we want to ensure that the trench has been constructed correctly before we give access to our electricians to run cables through it, to manage the risk of handover between trades, we want to do a mandrel test, basically a check, where we pull a big plastic ball through the conduit to ensure it's not broken and there's no debris in there. Now we've got all the background information for our construction activity, the next step is to populate the structure. We'll list out our methodology, specifications, test methods, timing and frequency, acceptance criteria and the responsible person. I recommend going through and reading the example inspection and test plan in detail. You'll get a better idea of the types of checks and test methods we document. For example, under Section 3, Construction, our test activity is trench excavation, which we want to ensure is excavated to the correct depth below finished surface level. The governing specifications are the IFC design, project and Australian standards. We want to get a survey confirmation of the trench depth below finished surface level and a site engineer will check this. We only have it down as a witness point. Once we've drafted our ITP, we'll then need to get it reviewed and approved. This will happen internally by a senior project engineer or project engineer and our project's quality management team. A quality engineer should always review our ITPs to ensure all checks have been covered. Once the internal review is complete, we'll submit this to the client or owner's engineer for their approval. All comments need to be closed out prior to using the ITP. Often, there'll be lots of comments plus extended review periods. I've seen ITPs take up to six weeks to get approval. Therefore, we need to be proactive and make sure we're preparing our ITPs long before they're needed on site. Once our ITP is approved, it's time to start works and complete the inspection and testing in a...